Well, welcome back. In this session, we're going to be looking at restrictive diseases. And these are very different from the obstructive diseases that we considered in the previous two sessions. Of course, in obstructive diseases, you've got airway obstruction, and this is accompanied usually by a substantial increase in lung volumes. But in restrictive diseases, the lung volumes are small, and we'll see, rather surprisingly, that uh, airflow, at least under some conditions, can be uh, normal or even increased compared with the normal lung. So restrictive diseases can be described as shown here. They're diseases in which the expansion of the lung is restricted, either because of alterations in the lung parenchyma, and we're going to be talking quite a bit about those conditions, or because of diseases of the pleura, the chest wall, or the neuromusculature. So let's start now by looking at diseases of the lung parenchyma. Now what do we mean by the parenchyma? We mean the, the gas exchanging regions of the lung, the alveolar regions of the lung. And so we should start by reviewing the uh, information about the uh, anatomy, the histology, the fine structure of the gas exchanging regions. And here's an old friend, it's an electron micrograph of a pulmonary capillary. And it reminds us that on one side, the thin side of the capillary, we have an alveolar, a type 1 alveolar epithelial cell here with its uh, cytoplasm stretching out over the outside of the blood gas barrier. We've got alveolar gas here, of course, and alveolar gas here, and this is the lumen of the capillary here. And then on the, the innermost layer is made up of a capillary endothelial cell. And here we have the nucleus here and the cytoplasm going out along here. And between those two cellular layers, we have the extracellular matrix, or can be called the interstitium, which on the thin side is made up of the fused basement membranes of the epithelial cell and the endothelial cell. And this extracellular matrix is a critical part of the structure of the capillary because, of course, the blood gas barrier is extremely thin, the order of 0 0.2, 0 0.3 of a micron in thickness, and therefore it's vulnerable in terms of its mechanical properties. And we believe that the extracellular matrix here is, has the components that are responsible for the strength of the barrier. Here's a high power view of the blood gas barrier. Now what we've got here is the same capillary as shown in the previous slide, although it's been turned through 90 degrees, and somebody has selected a region of the blood gas barrier, shown here, and blown it way up to a very high magnification. In fact, if you can see, the uh, bar line here is only 0.4 microns, so it's extremely small. And we can see very clearly the alveolar epithelial layer here, the endothelial layer here, the plasma in the capillary here, and the extracellular matrix between the two layers. And in the center of the extracellular matrix is this electron-dense band which we believe contains the type 4 collagen that's responsible for the strength of the barrier. And here's a little uh, diagram just showing this. You've got the, alveolar, you've got the alveolar gas here, the capillary blood here, got the alveolar epithelium here, the capillary endothelium here, and then this so-called lamina densa, it's an electron-dense layer, uh, in the center of the extracellular matrix here, with some cellular attachments, and that we believe uh, contains this type 4 collagen, which is, in a sense, the lifeline of the blood gas barrier, because, of course, if the blood gas barrier is breached, then the contents of the capillary spill into the alveolar spaces, and that would never do. Now, let's go back and look at the other side of the blood gas barrier. Remember, we said the blood gas barrier is polarized, the two sides have different functions. And on the other side, 
Uh, you see it's a thicker blood gas barrier here, so it's obviously not so useful for gas exchange. And we can see a couple of features here. One of the most important is actually not easy to identify, but this is a fibroblast which is in the interstitium, and you can see a prolongation of the cytoplasm of the fibroblast into this thick side of the blood gas barrier. The fibroblast is extremely important in the context of restrictive diseases because it's the fibroblast that makes type 1 collagen, which uh, is responsible for the fibrosis that occurs in these conditions, as we'll see in a moment. So this fibroblast is a very important cell, and we uh, make a note of it here. The other thing we see in the thick side of the blood gas barrier are these fibrils of type 1 collagen. This is the same kind of collagen that you have in your Achilles tendon, for example, very, very strong tissue. And this type 1 collagen, we, it's, again, it's electron dense. We can see the fibrils, uh, at least I can see them quite clearly here. And this type 1 collagen uh, that we see here is part of a cable, which is shown in the next slide here, which snakes its way along the alveolar wall, crossing from one side of a capillary to the other, a type 1 collagen cable. And apparently this cable is essential in uh, the integrity, preserving the integrity of the alveolar wall and presumably the capillaries themselves. So this is an important feature, and this is on the thick side of the blood gas barrier. Now, there are a number of other features of the lung parenchyma that we should certainly note in passing. One is the type 2 alveolar epithelial cell. Remember, we mentioned the type 1 cell in the previous slides. That's the, that's the main pavement cell, the main structural cell of the alveolus. But now we have the type 2 alveolar epithelial cell, quite a different looking cell, uh, rather globular in shape. It has a ring of microvilli around it, which allows us to always, it's a characteristic, allows us to identify the cell. And you can see there are holes through which the precursor of surfactant is extruded onto the alveolar surface. Now, surfactant, as we discussed extensively in the respiratory physiology section, surfactant is critical because it reduces the surface tension of the alveolar lining layer. It maintains the stability of the lung, which otherwise would be very unstable, and it has other functions as well. It tends to prevent the development of pulmonary edema, and it also reduces, it also uh, reduces the stiffness of the lung, increases the compliance of the lung, so it's easier to expand. So surfactant, very important material. This, by the way, is a very beautiful scanning electron micrograph because in the background we can see the type 1 cells very clearly. Let's have a quick look at a cross-section of a type 2 alveolar epithelial cell, and that's shown here. You can see this large nucleus and also these so-called laminated bodies in the cytoplasm here. And notice that they've got this sort of onion skin appearance, and that's very characteristic of surfactant. So these, uh, this material is going to be extruded from this cell onto the alveolar surface, and it's going to form the surfactant. Type 2 alveolar epithelial cells are metabolically very active. Surfactant is turned over rapidly within a couple of days, and these cells are busy making this uh, surfactant material. Uh, they are, in contrast to the type 1 cell, the type 1 cell is a pretty lazy cell, doesn't do much metabolically. But the type 2 cells are very active, have a very large nucleus, as you can see, and uh, they are, uh, and they also, incidentally, are important in repair, because if the type 1 cells are destroyed by some pathological process, their place is taken by type 2 alveolar epithelial cells, which then transform into type 1 cells, it's believed. The little inset here just shows a scanning electron micrograph, and again you can see the microvilli around the edge of the uh, type 2 cell, which are characteristic. Now another cell that we should look at is the alveolar macrophage, 
And this is shown here, another beautiful scanning electron micrograph. And the alveolar macrophage roams around the surface of the alveoli by amoeboid activity. It is able to phagocytose foreign material and its job is to keep the alveoli clean. And uh, it's a, uh, an extremely important cell. You know, the alveoli do not have the mucociliary escalator, which is uh, present on the airways of the lung and is responsible for keeping the airways clean. But the alveoli do not have that. Instead, they have these alveolar macrophages that roam around and uh, mop up any material that should not be there. And in this beautiful micrograph, here's the alveolar macrophage, here's a type 2 alveolar epithelial cell, and here are some type 1 cells here. So it's a beautiful uh, micrograph indeed. Here's another view of an alveolar macrophage. And for first, you might have a bit of a problem working out what's going on. But here's the side of the, here's part of the wall of the alveolus here, going down here and going out here. So what we've got is the alveolar macrophage lurking in the corner of an alveolus and, and picking up whatever is, 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 uh, shouldn't be there and phagocytosing it. And you'll notice that it's picked up some material here and these are remnants of, uh, of surfactant. As I mentioned earlier, surfactant turns over quite rapidly and the remnants are picked up uh, by, in part at least, by macrophages as shown here. And uh, this is part of the business of keeping the alveoli clean. So that's a brief review of the, uh, of the parenchyma. Let me just finish by just asking the question, why are there thick and thin sides of the blood gas barrier? Why is the blood gas barrier polarized in this way? Well, of course, the thin side is mainly responsible for gas exchange. Gas exchange, of course, by passive diffusion, requires a very thin and a barrier and a barrier of an immense area. And the thin side of the blood gas barrier fulfills both of those criteria. On the other side, we have other things going on. First of all, we have the, uh, the uh, type 1 collagen cable that I mentioned before. That's important in maintaining the strength of the alveolar wall, apparently. Uh, but in addition, the, the thick side of the blood gas barrier is very much involved with fluid exchange. So the thin side is for gas exchange, the thick side for fluid exchange. And incidentally, we're going to be talking much more about that in the next session when we deal with vascular diseases, including pulmonary edema. Okay, so that's a nice, that's a quick review of the parenchyma, the structure of the parenchyma of the lung. And then let's go on to one of the most important diseases that we're going to discuss, and that is diffuse interstitial pulmonary fibrosis. Now it's a little bit confusing because a number of other names have been given to this disease, also known as idiopathic interstitial fibrosis. Actually, you'll hear the term idiopathic quite frequently. Interstitial pneumonia and cryptogenic fibrosing alveolitis. But actually, diffuse interstitial pulmonary fibrosis is, is a term that's frequently used, and it's the one we're going to uh, uh, concentrate on. And let's look at the pathology of this particular disease. Well, as you will gather, by now, it has to do with laying down of collagen, fi fibrous tissue, in the interstitium of the alveolar wall. And so the cardinal feature is thickening of the interstitium of the alveolar wall with collagen. Actually, the initial infiltration occurs with lymphocytes and plasmacytes, apparently. But then you get these fibroblasts laying down these thick collagen bundles. The, the in the process, the alveoli may contain a cellular exudate, and that's called desquamation. And uh, that is part of the, of the uh, pathological process, the pathogenetic process, uh, this uh, period of desquamation. And eventually, the architecture of the parenchyma is essentially destroyed with extensive scarring. You've got uh, lots of type 1 collagen, you have dilated air spaces, and eventually you get what's called honeycombing, as we'll see in a moment.
Now scarring is a, an end result of a number of pathological processes. For example, if you see somebody with a scar on his arm, you don't know whether he's had a nasty bacterial infection there uh, of some kind, and that is healed but left a scar. There may have been trauma uh, in a, an accident, a car accident or whatever, which has left a scar. He may have been burnt on the arm and that's left a scar. So there are all sorts of, path of, of pathological processes which will end up with scarring, which is basically the laying down of type 1 collagen. And the same is true of diffuse interstitial pulmonary fibrosis. We, we're not aware of the pathological process that was responsible for the scarring. And what we see is the end result. Now here's a nice uh, electron micrograph from a patient, the lung of a patient, with diffuse interstitial pulmonary fibrosis. Yet not many of these around, not easy to get a uh, uh, electron micrograph from this tissue actually. But here you can see quite clearly, that here's the capillary here, red blood cell, the plasma here, alveolar space here, and you can see that the collagen laid down, first of all on the thick side here, where it definitely ought not to be because clearly that's going to interfere with the diffusion of gases through the blood gas barrier, and on the other side of the uh, capillary as well. We've got these big bands of type 1 collagen. And actually here you can see uh, that the, uh, the micrograph has picked up a bundle of collagen and you can actually see the fibers running along. Of course, normally it's cut across the fibers, but here uh, we happen to have some fibrous bundles and you can see these bundles of type 1 collagen. You can also see them over here actually. And uh, these represent, of course, uh, a serious problem with uh, gas exchange in this, uh, uh, in this alveolar wall. Here's another view. Now this is a light micrograph and you can see this tremendous thickening of the alveolar walls here. In fact, you can perhaps hardly recognize them as alveoli, but that's what they are. Thickening of the alveolar walls, uh, great uh, amounts of collagen here. And uh, you can see the disorganization of the architecture caused by this scarring process. Another feature is that the capillaries are few and far between. I can see one here, I can see one here, another one here perhaps. But what's happened is that this, the laying down of the collagen has obliterated many of the capillaries. So a reduction in, in capillary blood volume is a feature of diffuse interstitial pulmonary fibrosis. Now let's uh, review briefly some of the clinical features of this condition. It's not a particularly common disease, fortunately. Uh, not common like, for example, uh, COPD or asthma, uh, which are extremely common. Uh, but uh, diffuse interstitial pulmonary fibrosis is less common, uh, but of course we see it all the time, but it uh, is uh, nothing like the prevalence of these other diseases. It tends to affect middle-aged adults. Uh, it doesn't come on usually in the 60s or so, when you often see COPD, uh, but it's in, in somewhat younger middle-aged adults. And one of the first symptoms very often is shortness of breath. Uh, the patient will often say that he, he has no dyspnea at rest, but uh, when, he ex when he climbs stairs, for example, uh, he used to be able to climb a couple of flights of stairs with no problem, but now he finds that he gets short of breath. And uh, this is a feature, and probably this has come on during the last two or three years. It's something that occurs fairly rapidly, again, unlike COPD, which typically occurs over 10 years or so, in, in this disease, the shortness of breath tends to come on fairly rapidly and he will complain that he can't do what he was able to do before. Um, he'll, he may also notice, or you may notice, that he's got rather rapid shallow breathing. That's a feature of this disease. He has a reduced exercise capacity, either uh, walking along, uh, walking up a hill, uh, or climbing stairs, for example. And another feature that it, he often complains about is fatigue. That um, after exercise, or even in the absence of exercise, he feels fatigued, and this seems to be a feature of this disease. 
He may have a dry cough, an unproductive cough. Now, sputum is not seen in this disease. If he has a cough with sputum, he's probably got bronchitis as well. But usually with this disease, it's an unproductive dry cough, but it can be a nuisance. And uh, when you examine him, you'll notice, if the disease is at all advanced, that he's clearly got a reduced chest movement. If you ask him to take in a full inspiration, it's obvious that he can't move his chest as much as a normal subject can. On auscultation, he will have fine crepitations throughout the lung if the disease is well enough advanced. Uh, these are fine crackles. Um, sometimes people say they're a bit like what happens if you move your fingers like this near your ear, this fine sort of crackling sound. Uh, quite different, for example, from the crepitations that you see, with, that you hear with uh, pulmonary edema, for example, which are, are much coarser. Uh, so these fine, and incidentally, as far as I know, the origin of these fine crepitations is not fully understood. Uh, there's no fluid in the lung, uh, so it's certainly not fluid, uh, but in some way the, the disorganization of the architecture of the lung, which we've seen, is responsible for these fine crepitations. Patient may have finger clubbing, that's one of the features, and a chest radiograph uh, shows changes. Uh, it'll show small lungs very often, and if the disease is far enough advanced, it'll show a reticular pattern. Not a, not a dramatic change in the chest x-ray, but is, is quite clearly seen. Um, later in the disease, there may be a honeycomb appearance, as we'll see in a moment. Here's a radiograph of diffuse interstitial pulmonary fibrosis. The lungs are small, as you can see. The diaphragms have been pulled up somewhat. The chest on this side particularly seems to be pulled in. The ribs are rather oblique. Uh, and you've got clear changes in the lung fields. You've got some uh, shadowing here, which is quite obvious. But if you look very carefully, and I'm not sure you can see them in this reproduction, but you'll find that there is also a diffuse uh, um, shadowing of, of, of small spots uh, that are throughout both lung fields. That's typical of diffuse interstitial pulmonary fibrosis. Now the next uh, uh, image shows, a, it's a nice image, it shows a CT scan of a patient with extensive interstitial fibrosis and I show it because it's a beautiful example of, of honeycombing. See the honeycombing here? In other words, what you've got are these small cavities. They're either enlarged, perhaps alveolar ducts or, or, or um, slightly larger airways, and these have been pulled open by the scarring of the parenchyma around them, and they form this typical honeycomb appearance. You can also see it on a, on a plain film uh, in advanced disease. But this is a particularly nice example here. And actually, also, you can see that the scarring in the parenchyma has apparently expanded the airways to some extent. See, they're being pulled open. Here's an airway here, and it's being pulled open by the scarring around it. And uh, this is uh, an interesting feature, an important feature in the physiology of this particular condition. So let's look at pulmonary function in, this, in diffuse interstitial pulmonary fibrosis. And we're going to look at that under five headings here. One is ventilatory capacity and mechanics, which is a very important feature. Another is gas exchange, which is a, an interesting problem in this disease, as we'll see. The pulmonary circulation is seriously affected, exercise is impaired, and the control of ventilation is interesting, as we'll see. Now, ventilatory capacity and mechanics are seriously impaired, and what you've got is a reduced, as we'll see in a moment, a reduced forced expiratory volume and forced vital capacity. But interestingly, the ratio of FEV to FVC is often preserved uh, and actually may even be increased compared with normal, as we'll see. All lung volumes are reduced, and there is a usually a striking reduction in lung compliance. In other words, the lung is much stiffer, much more difficult to expand. Now we've seen this uh, image before, but it's a nice way of just reminding ourselves of the normal 
forced expiration with the forced expiratory volume, volume exhaled in one second, and the forced vital capacity, the total volume exhaled from total lung capacity to residual volume. Now in obstructive diseases, as we saw in the last couple of sessions, the FEV is grossly reduced, and that's because of the severe airway obstruction, but the FVC is also reduced, and this is because the diseased airways are closed prematurely, and, uh, they, and therefore the, uh, the, the subject does not get down to a low lung volume. The residual volume uh, typically is enormously increased in, in COPD, for example. In restrictive disease, the situation is different. The force vital capacity and the FEV are reduced because the volumes of the lung are grossly reduced. But the FEV as a percentage of the FVC is normal or may be increased. And you can see this here. In the normal subject, the FEV as a percent of the FVC was 80%, okay, grossly reduced in obstructive disease to 42, but in this particular example in restrictive disease actually increased to 90%. So that this is interesting, isn't it? The lung is very abnormal. The patient is able to exhale gas uh, very rapidly, uh, not over a very long uh, volume, a very large volume, but during the first second, the expiration is very fast indeed. We can also see that if we look at the forced expiratory flows. You recall this is the average flow rate during the middle of the expired volume. Okay, you mark off the middle of the volume and you calculate the flow rate. And you can see that in the normal subject uh, here, the flow rate was 3.5 liters per second. Obstructive disease, of course, it was grossly reduced, 1.4. But in restrictive disease here, the forced expiratory flow is 3.7, actually exceeds the value in the normal subject. So again, that's an example of the fact that the patient is able to exhale initially at a very high flow rate. That's also seen in the flow volume curves. Here's a normal flow volume curve here. The flow volume curve, you'll recall, is done by asking a patient to breathe into total lung capacity and breathe out as hard as he can to residual volume. We discussed this extensively in the respiratory physiology section. Now, in obstructive disease, we get a quite a different pattern. And incidentally, here we've got the, the flow volume curves plotted on the uh, absolute lung volume, which normally is not available to us, but it makes an important point here. In obstructive disease, the patient begins and ends his expiration at a high lung volume. Okay? In restrictive disease, on the other hand, he begins and ends at a lower lung volume than the normal subject. Very striking in this case. And furthermore, you can see that during most of the expiration, the flow rate for the patient with restrictive disease actually exceeds the flow rate from the, the patient with a normal lung. So again, we're seeing this remarkable ability of these patients to exhale rapidly. And the reason for that is shown here. It has to do with the fact that the caliber of the airways is in part determined by the radial traction of the lung parenchyma. And the normal lung is shown here. We have a nice big airway here with the, the alveoli pulling it open. Even so, in the normal lung, during a forced expiration, you get dynamic compression of the airways. The airways are compressed and you recall that flow is determined by alveolar minus intrapleural pressure. Flow becomes effort independent. This is much more marked in emphysema, partly because the alveoli are not pulled open by the radial traction of the parenchyma around them. The alveolar walls are destroyed. But look at what happens in fibrosis. In diffuse interstitial pulmonary fibrosis, the lung is pulled open by the scar tissue. And therefore, the effects of dynamic compression are greatly reduced. And that is the reason why these patients can exhale uh, um, initially uh, at a, a faster rate. They can move gas out at a, uh, at a higher flow rate than normal subjects. It's this scarring that's responsible.
Let's look at the lung volumes in interstitial fibrosis. Well, they're all reduced. Uh, TLC, total lung capacity, functional residual capacity, and residual volume. But it's interesting that the relative proportions are nearly preserved. That again, it's very different from COPD, where typically, for example, the residual volume becomes a very large, a much higher proportion of the total lung capacity than it should be uh, under normal conditions. So uh, that's uh, the contrast between uh, interstitial fibrosis and uh, obstructive lung disease here. The reason for the small lung volumes has to do with the compliance of the lung. The fibrous tissue makes the lung very stiff. And not surprising, is it? Because if you see a scar on the arm, uh, that scar is very stiff. So type 1 collagen, uh, which is what's responsible for the scar, uh, in, uh, ca causes a good deal of stiffness. And what you can see here, first of all, here's the lung volume here. This is shown as predicted TLC, and, and that's simply because people of different size have different volumes and uh, lung volumes, and so this is a better way of showing it, plotted against transpulmonary pressure, the difference between alveolar pressure and intrapleural pressure. And the normal curve is shown here as a nice uh, red line. And here's interstitial fibrosis, and you can see that there's a gross reduction in lung volume at a given transpulmonary pressure. And furthermore, the slope of the line, that's the change in volume per unit change in pressure or compliance, that's greatly reduced. So the uh, compliance is enormously, re enormously reduced in this disease and contrast it with emphysema shown here, where the compliance has increased, the volume for a given transpulmonary pressure is very high and the slope of the line is increased. And that I like to think of is, is due to the destruction of the architecture of the lung. And the lung has lost its recoil, normal recoil uh, um, ability, and that's what gives you those changes in emphysema. Another interesting feature about this plot is that the intrapleural pressure at TLC is very, very high. Now, if we, if we put intrapleural pressure here and the alveolar pressure uh, is atmospheric, then of course these are negative numbers here. So the intrapleural pressure goes to a very negative value in interstitial fibrosis. And sometimes uh, people use this as a test. Uh, the uh, intrapleural pressure is measured from esophageal pressure, which is obtained by putting a small balloon into the esophagus, and uh, that allows us to measure the intrapleural pressure. And it's extremely negative in this condition, more, much more so than in normal subjects. And look at the patient with emphysema. The patient with emphysema has lost most of his elastic recoil, and so uh, the, the most negative intrapleural pressure that he can develop with a, going to total lung capacity is, is, uh, is miserable, less than minus 10 centimeters of water here. So these are the, this, the pressure volume curves are critically important in this disease. Let's look at gas exchange. Now these patients always have a reduction in arterial PO2. They have uh, diseased lungs which interfere with gas exchange. So the arterial PO2 is always reduced. It's not uh, reduced to extremely low values, but it's always abnormally low. There's always hypoxemia. However, the PCO2 is usually normal or may even be low. And we'll see a possible reason for that uh, a little bit later on. A feature of these patients is that the arterial PO2 often falls on exercise. That's an important uh, in, an interesting feature. And another feature is that the diffusing capacity is always reduced. Uh, this actually can be a useful diagnostic point because sometimes a patient will come in, it, it's not always easy to diagnose diffuse interstitial pulmonary fibrosis, and sometimes there's some uncertainty about it. And if the diffusing capacity is measured and it's found to be normal and, and it also increases on exercise, then uh, there's a real question of whether this really is interstitial fibrosis because that would be very unusual and, and that would cause us to think again about the diagnosis. So that a reduced diffusing capacity is always an important, is uh, always seen.
Now, an interesting problem which has exercised physiologists for many years is to what extent is the hypoxemia caused by diffusion impairment? I mean, clearly, if you look at a section, histological section of this disease, then you can't expect normal diffusion. Uh, you, here you've got a capillary and you've got this great big thick alveolar wall. So obviously the diffusion of gases within a lung like this is going to be abnormal. But on the other hand, there, the, the lung has substantial r reserves of diffusion, particularly at rest. Uh, this is just to remind us of the time course of the PO2 in the pulmonary capillary as blood is loaded uh, oxygen is loaded in the pulmonary capillary and you can see that under normal conditions at rest some two-thirds of the capillary is available uh, that is not being used for uh, loading the oxygen. The, the most, essentially all of the oxygen is loaded in the first one-third of the capillary. So we've got quite a bit of diffusion in reserve. And so there's been quite a bit of dispute as to how important diffusion limitation in the hypoxemia of interstitial fibrosis is. And we looked at that a number of years ago and measured the distribution of ventilation perfusion ratios in a series of patients with diffuse interstitial pulmonary fibrosis. And we're able to show with that, with that particular technique, you can predict the arterial PO2 based on the amount of ventilation ventilation perfusion inequality. And we found that at rest, in these patients at rest, there was a good agreement between the predicted value based on VAQ inequality and the measured value. So what this said was that at rest, no, it looks as though there is no hypoxemia caused by the disease. But then when we exercised the patients, we found that there was a difference between the regression line and the line of identity. In other words, that the measured arterial PO2 was less than the predicted value based on the degree of ventilation perfusion inequality. And so this was strong evidence that there was some diffusion limitation of oxygen transfer sufficient to lower the arterial PO2 on exercise, but not at rest. And that's probably, uh, the, the, that's probably the case with most patients. Let's look at the pulmonary circulation, which is quite abnormal in these patients. One reason is that the capillaries are obliterated. Uh, we saw that earlier on. Uh, the pulmonary vascular resistance, therefore, it will be raised because you've lost a lot of the conduits. I mean, the, uh, the capillaries just, are just destroyed. Uh, and of course, you would expect and you get pulmonary hypertension, uh, particularly on exercise. But although these patients, if they've got severe disease, can certainly develop pulmonary hypertension at rest. And this is just to remind us that the capillaries are obliterated, that uh, as we saw before, there are very few capillaries to be seen here, and they've all been uh, gob gobbled up, if you like, by the, uh, uh, by the fibrosis, which is extensive in the alveoli here. Exercise is a problem with these patients, and here's a, some nice data on gas exchange in exercise in, in a patient with pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, here's the normal subject here first, and you can see that on exercise he was able to uh, have an oxygen intake, oxygen uptake of about three liters a minute. That's a, quite a good value. Uh, you'll also notice that there was quite a substantial increase in tidal volume when he exercised, as you would expect, and also that his arterial PO2, shown here, uh, hardly changed when he went all the way from uh, rest up to uh, a fairly high level of exercise, three liters a minute. Uh, there was an, or, or, almost no change in his PCO2 as well. So those are, that's the normal pattern uh, on exercise. But look at the patient, very, very different situation. First of all, notice that his maximal oxygen consumption was no more than about, what, one and a half liters a minute, something like that, reduced to a half of what it was in the normal subject here. Next, you'll see that there was almost no increase in tidal volume. Now, what this means is that in spite of this quite high ventilation here, and I should have said his ventilation increases 
about as much, or actually even a bit more perhaps than the normal subject. So a big increase in ventilation, almost no increase in tidal volume. So this means rapid shallow breathing. And finally, what we see is a dramatic fall in the arterial PO2 as the exercise level increases. Okay, and this incidentally in spite of a rise in the alveolar PO2. So all this is consistent with uh, a lung which uh, uh, is not able to uh, mount the oxygen uptake of a normal lung. Uh, the breathing is, the pattern is very abnormal with a very small rise in tidal volume, rapid shallow breathing and the arterial PO2 falling on exercise, as you would expect from what we were saying just earlier, that there is some diffusion limitation on exercise, and this is pr presumably largely responsible for the fall in arterial PO2. Let's say a word or two about the control of ventilation. As we've said, there's rapid, shallow breathing. And furthermore, under normal conditions, the PCO2 is essentially normal, or may even be low in this condition. It's a feature. So it looks as though something is stimulating breathing in this condition. And a lot of people think this may be the J receptors. Now, I don't know if you recall the juxtacapillary receptors. We talked about those in the respiratory physiology uh, sessions on, um, on the control of ventilation. These are receptors that have their endings in the alveolar wall. And it's reasonable to expect that they're stimulated by the laying down of collagen in the alveolar wall. And, and certainly we see rapid shallow breathing, which would be consistent with stimulation of the J receptors. They also uh, are stimulated, by the way, during in, in um, uh, edema, in uh, pulmonary edema, and you also get rapid shallow breathing in pulmonary edema, possibly because of the, the same reason. The work of breathing is an interesting subject. These patients, of course, have very stiff lungs, as we saw before, that they, uh, you need a lot of intrapleural pressure to expand the lung. So if, if you're going to try and expand the lung to its normal volume, the work of breathing is going to be enormous. So instead, these patients elect uh, to breathe uh, rapidly and shallowly, and that means that they don't expend a lot of work expanding the lung and therefore the, sh the rapid shallow breathing tends to reduce the work of breathing although of course it's going to be increased in this disease uh, because of the, uh, the very low compliance of the lung. One of the features of the rapid shallow breathing is that of course there's going to be a high dead space ventilation. That's a disadvantage of rapid shallow breathing because much of the breath that you're uh, breathing uh, using uh, going into the dead space. So let's just summarize here the pulmonary function in interstitial fibrosis. Uh, there's dyspnea and often the patient will present uh, with uh, a complaint that he is more short of breath than he should be when he's climbing stairs and typically there's shallow rapid breathing. There's a reduction in all lung volumes the FEV1 and the FVC are decreased, but the ratio is uh, often normal or even increased, as we saw. Airway resistance is normal or low when related to lung volume, and this is because the airways are pulled open by the radial traction of the lung parenchyma. There's a reduced lung compliance, as we saw, because of the scar tissue in the lung, very negative intrapleural pressures at total lung capacity, the arterial hypoxemia is chiefly due to ventilation perfusion inequality. Maybe I didn't actually say that, but I, I certainly implied it. At rest, you see, all the hypoxemia could be exp explained by the VAQ inequality. And even on exercise, most of the hypoxemia is caused by VAQ inequality. But diffusion impairment apparently contributes to the hypoxemia during exercise. There's a normal or low arterial PCO2 possibly because of the, in part by stimulation of the, of the J receptors. The reduced diffusing capacity for carbon monoxide is very important, an important diagnostic point, and uh, there's an increased pulmonary vascular resistance because the capillaries are destroyed by the emphysematous process.
Okay, now let's move on and let's look at other diseases that can cause interstitial fibrosis. I'm not going to go into these in detail because the, the, the um, pathophysiological, the, the uh, functional changes are, are similar in all these conditions. But they, we should just mention sarcoidosis, for example, which is a disease that can cause interstitial pulmonary fibrosis uh, in the later stages. Sarcoidosis is that the feature, the pathological feature, is a granuloma shown here. It's a non-caseating granuloma, so it's rather different from that seen in uh, tuberculosis, for example, big giant cells, and it's a characteristic of the disease. Sarcoidosis affects a number of organs. It's not just a disease of the lung. Uh, it affects the lymph nodes, the skin, the eyes, the spleen, and the pathogenesis is not fully understood. It, a lot of people think it's probably got an immunological basis, but it's still something of a mystery. And it can certainly cause interstitial pulmonary fibrosis in its later stages. Another disease uh, which can do the same thing is hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Now this is a disease of the parenchyma of the lung caused by inhaled organic dusts and you get a hypersensitivity to these. And one of the best examples is farmer's lung, which is caused by the spores in moldy hay. Uh, and uh, there's also a bird breeder's lung, uh, where the, uh, the fecal material from the birds uh, is largely responsible. The exposure is heavy. Uh, for example, in farmer's lung, the farmer is working with this, this hay over a long period of time, heavy exposure, and in the acute form you can get shortness of breath and a small fever and a cough. So there's a, uh, an acute form, but in long-standing disease you can develop interstitial fibrosis, which is why I'm mentioning it here. And there are other causes of diffuse interstitial fibrosis as well. There are collagen diseases, uh, such as generalized scleroderma, uh, drugs can cause it, busulfan uh, and bleomycin, which is a drug that's used for um, uh, in, in some types of cancer, can do it. Paraquat is an important cause. Paraquat is a, uh, a weed killer, which is extensively used, and uh, it um, causes a, a, a lethal form of interstitial fibrosis, very dangerous. Uh, oxygen toxicity can cause fibrosis, as can therapeutic radiation. Now let me finish by just talking about causes of restrictive disease which are outside the lung. And for example, pleural disease can affect the ability to expand the lung. And one of these is pneumothorax. Pneumothorax is caused by a, a, a problem with the visceral pleura, the pleura on the surface of the lung. If there's a, a, a hole in that for some reason, then of course air leaks from the alveoli into the intraperal space and you get a pneumothorax. In young people, it's caused, you get a thing called spontaneous pneumothorax. This is in uh, late teenagers, early people in their early 20s. Uh, uh, tall males are particularly likely to get this. And spontaneous pneumothorax is a, um, causes complete collapse of a lung, or may do, and here's a very striking example here. Here's the lung right up against the mediastinum here, and the rest, of the, the rest of the chest cage has no lung tissue at all, therefore it's very transradiant as you can see. And you can see that the chest wall is expanded here, compared with on this side where the ribs are more oblique. Sometimes you can get what's called a tension pneumothorax, and here you have a check valve which allows air to get into the pneumothorax during inspiration, but it can't get out. And you gradually develop a pneumothorax with a high pressure. And this is a potentially very dangerous situation. You get displacement of the mediastinum, and I can just see the trachea here, which has been displaced to the left. You can also see the very large chest wall on this side to see how the ribs are very uh, horizontal here but very oblique here and um, you can see the, the diaphragm is, is depressed here as well. Uh, 
And uh, this is a medical emergency, and uh, in, the, in, in the emergency room, a tube needs to be put into this pneumothorax in order to relieve the pressure. Pleural effusion is another disease where you can get a, uh, an uh, impaired expansion of the lung because of effusion in the uh, intrapleural space. Here's an example of bilateral pleural effusion, not a particularly large one, but you, you can see plenty of effusion in the space there. And the causes of pleural effusion, often it's a malignancy or in, in heart disease, in heart failure, you may get pleural effusion. Pleural thickening sometimes occurs. Sometimes you get a scar in the pleura itself, which prevents the, the lung from expanding. That can uh, follow a uh, long-term pleural effusion, for example. And occasionally that scar tissue, that uh, fibrous tissue, has got to be removed surgically. Chest wall diseases can cause uh, restrictive disease. Scoliosis is one, and here's an example of scoliosis here. You can see this marked uh, change in the uh, distortion of the spine. If it's, if it's a lateral distortion, uh, lateral curvature, if it's posterior curvature, it's called kyphosis. And this can cause compression of parts of the lung. Actually, on this side, you can see the chest wall being pressed in here, and you can get collapse of the lung here on this side. And it's an example of uh, restrictive disease. <coughs> and uh, ankylo ankylosing spondylitis is another nasty disease where the where the uh, spine gradually becomes uh, immobile and uh, it becomes impossible for the patient to take a deep breath. Finally, there are neuromuscular diseases that can cause the lung to be restricted in its expansion. Poliomyelitis is one if the diaphragm is affected. Uh, the guillain barre syndrome is another. Um, myasthenia gravis affecting the myoneuro junction and muscular dystrophy diseases of the uh, of the muscles of respiration so that's all i'm going to say now about restrictive diseases uh, it's an interesting subject from the point of view of pathophysiology and they're an important group of diseases and uh, next time we're going to be talking about vascular diseases and so i look forward to seeing you then